One more thing worth celebrating, the Shahs are here with us. Sorry. Uh, the Shahs were on staff here for a couple years and are now up in San Francisco planting a church. Um, they're here on holiday, so don't ask them about planting a church. Ask them about how they're doing, but we love them. We celebrate the work they've done the last few years, grinding it out in a global pandemic in a city that's being evacuated. You guys have done well. We love you guys. And we're cheering for... We're cheering today for England in the Euro Cup final. It's been a long time since England has been in a final. The, the Shahs are from England. You'll pick that up if you introduce yourself to them. So if you've got a Bible, would you open it to Ephesians uh, chapter 4? Ephesians is a letter written to a church in Ephesus. Paul writes the letter. It's a favorite of, 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 of most of us probably here. Chapter 4, verses uh, 1 through 6. I, this is Paul the Apostle, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Today, I want to continue speaking on the subject of uh, unity. Last week was uh, part one. You can catch that maybe on YouTube or the podcast if you uh, missed it. This week is part two because I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe we need two weeks on the topic of unity. Probably just two. We'll be good from here on out, right? <laughs> we'll probably pretty well have covered it, dealt with all our issues, and we should be good going forward. All we needed was a two-part series. No, we can laugh or we can cry. This has been uh, heavy on our hearts, and, and most of us have, have been troubled by the state of our nation, and maybe more importantly, the state of the church. And so today, I'm specifically going to address uh, Christian unity, unity in the church. Now, what I'm going to say will certainly apply to how you're an American citizen. But what I'm about to say is written to those who are citizens of heaven, those who belong to the hope that we have in Christ, is how Paul puts it in that passage. So I'm going to unpack Ephesians chapter 4. Last week was very personal as I talked to you about the journey uh, that I went on. Uh, last week, while kind of um, focusing on unity. This week, I really want to work to unpack Ephesians uh, chapter 4, and it, it may be a little uh, less of a personal journey and more of an unpacking of this uh, text. So we are going to work through the passage we just read, asking three uh, questions the first is, what is the calling that we've received? The second, what is the unity of the Spirit that we are, as followers of Jesus, to maintain? And then more, most importantly, um, how? How can it be uh, maintained? So first, what is the calling we've received? Paul starts with like, I, I beg you. I beg you, live a life worthy of the calling. And Paul's really clear that if the church were to live a life worthy of the calling, the byproduct would be more unity. We talked uh, last week about how when unity becomes our focus, we don't end up often closer to unity, but that unity is a byproduct. 
something that comes as we focus on something greater than ourselves. So Paul is saying, I beg you, I beg you, live a life worthy of the calling. And he knows that if the church does this, they'll end up standing in unity with one another. But the question becomes for us, what the heck are we called to do? What has God called us? What has God called us to? What have we been called? And Paul lays this out pretty clearly in the first three chapters of Ephesians. Let me just show you a highlight of really our our calling, what we've been called to. In chapter 1, verse 4, Paul makes it clear that God chose us for himself to be in him before the world was created. In chapter 1, verse 5, he predestined us to be his children, and that means that we're heirs of all that the Father owns. This is our calling. In chapter 1, verse 7, that he sent Christ to atone for all of our trespasses, to deal with what stands between us and God. In chapter 1, verse 13, he sealed us with his Holy Spirit, preserving us forever. In chapter 2, verse 7, he promises to spend an eternity increasing our joy as we experience the riches of his grace. And in chapter 3, verse 10, it says that God has given us this call. He's given us a mission as a church to then display his wisdom. We are destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory, to live unto the glory of God. And there is an honor and a value to this position and the place that we've been given. And it should be so valuable to us that we don't want to do anything to misrepresent this high call that we've been given John Piper said this, that this does not mean that we should try to deserve our place in God. It means that we should recognize how much our place in God deserves from us. What we've been given, the place and the position, has been gifted to us. We don't earn it or deserve it, but that place, that position deserves something from us. It's a high call. And we dare not do anything to bring it into disrepute or act in a way that doesn't represent. That's what Paul's saying. Represent. There are times where I'm tempted uh, to sin and I think to myself, man, I'm a pastor. And it constrains my behavior and it invites me into virtue. I mean, so two two things. Just this morning, I thought, I'm going to wear shorts. It's hot. And I thought, I'm the pastor. I would have left in a t-shirt and shorts. But I thought, I'm the pastor. Someone who's going to be here for the first time is going to think, does that guy lead this thing? So I thought, you know, iron a shirt, put some pants on. You're a big boy. Lead the church. It constrained my behavior and led me into, I I don't know if it's called virtue. It's It's a collared shirt. I don't know if it's virtuous. You know, another thing too, I was in the bathroom about to leave. I was in a hurry. I was thinking about my sermon and I was about to walk out without washing my hands and I saw someone in there and I thought again, you're the pastor. Like you need to wash your hands after you use the bathroom. This person's going to think that you're gross. So I turned around and I washed my hands. It constrained my behavior and it led me into virtue. And there are many times, those are silly stories. Those happened this morning though. Those are silly stories, but there are other times where I think to myself, no, Travis, you speak, you speak as one who speaks the very words of God. And again, it constrains my behavior and it, and it calls me into virtue. By the way, That text that says that we should speak as those who are speaking the very words of God is not written to preachers. It's written to us as Christians. Your call should constrain you and call you into virtue. It shouldn't just be the pastor going, 
you know, I shouldn't do that. I represent God. You should also be thinking, my goodness, how I drive with that fish on the back of my car represents our God. And this is all real funny, but we know that we've been upset when police don't act in a way that represents the badge, represents the uniform. And fellow officers would be the first to say, this misrepresents the high call that we've been given. This behavior misrepresents the power that we've been given. Or when Olympic athletes who are representing our nation don't give honor or respect to the flag, we get upset because we think that that position deserves something. That platform demands something of them that they're unwilling to give. So let me get you back off the police and athletes, back on to the church. What's been so difficult about this year and a half is it just doesn't represent us well. It misrepresents the disunity, the dysfunction, the discord, the division. It misrepresents this high call that we've been given. And Paul is saying here, really quickly, unity represents in a disunity, a division. It misrepresents the call that we've been given. One of the ways, and I would say one of the main ways that we live a life worthy of the calling that we've received, worthy of the position and the place that we've received, is maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I read this text and thought, what is even the unity of the Spirit? I mean, I say it and I think, oh, yeah, 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 sounds profound, sounds mysterious. And I thought, what is this like? The vibes, what are we talking about here? This sounds like a, a yoga pose, the unity of the spirit. It's like downward dog. And it's actually not that elusive. It's fairly concrete. The Holy Spirit of God creates unity around at least three things. The Holy Spirit of God creates unity around conviction. We have shared convictions. We have a shared understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done that creates unity, a community here. A shared, as Paul writes it, um, knowledge of the Son of God. He'll write uh, in, in further down in, in Ephesians 4 that we reach unity in the knowledge of the Son of God. So our shared convictions is part of what creates unity here. When I say conviction, you think about how the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin and he does convict you of sin. But the Holy Spirit also convinces us concerning God's glorious gospel and his grace. The Holy Spirit reveals who Jesus is to us and convinces us to where we now have convictions about our understanding of Jesus, and it creates a common bond. The second thing that the Spirit does that creates, that's very concrete, is the Holy Spirit produces confidence in the heart of the believer. We have one Father. We share a Father. And the Holy Spirit creates a confidence that we are His sons and daughters. It's by the Spirit that we can confidently cry, Abba, Father. And anyone who receives the Spirit starts to understand that they're a son and a daughter. And this produces confidence. We have a Father. Therefore, we belong. And therefore, what is his is ours. And therefore, we have a future and a hope. And we have promise and this confidence in God's promise. And in him as father creates community. And lastly, the Holy Spirit is at work in us producing the fruit of the Spirit. 
which is the way that we care for one another. He enables us to care for one another by producing fruit in our lives, by making us more like Christ, showing love. The Holy Spirit's interested in us growing in love. The Holy Spirit wants us to experience peace, joy. The Holy Spirit's working to make us more like Jesus, which means more gentle, more good, more self-controlled. This is the work of the Spirit. So the Spirit, if you think about it, produces unity by producing convictions, confidence, and care for one another. So it's, it's very concrete. And when he says maintain this, he means it. Maintain these convictions. Maintain the confidence. Maintain the care for one another. Don't do anything to get in the way of what the Holy Spirit is doing. In one sense, Christian unity, our unity to one another, has been achieved not by our efforts to, to get along, not by our effort to, to be nice or to be less annoyed, but by the work of God. Our unity together has been achieved by the effort of another, by something God has done. And so therefore, the language here in the text is you should maintain this. It's already been bought. It's already been won. It's already been achieved. I'm asking you simply to steward what God has done our unity is, in fact, today, right now, a unit are, is a reality to be maintained. Let me read from Ephesians 2, a couple chapters earlier, a text that's it's, it's important. You've probably heard it before. I read it last week. But it says that now, right now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him... We both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and you're members of the household of God. This is a reality to be maintained. This text shows that through one decisive act, we have been made one. So Paul's saying, stay one, because you've already been made one, right? It is a reality. But in another sense... If you keep reading Ephesians, you'll realize that unity is also a goal to be attained, not just a reality to be maintained. Further down in Ephesians 4, Paul says that Christ has given to the church leaders, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God. So our Christian unity is to be maintained because it's been bought. And then it's also this goal that we're reaching for to realize. The reason that leaders are at work in the church, Paul says, is to help us realize this goal. The reason there's coaches in the church is to say, work together. This is the end to which we're headed. This is the goal. And this is why God gave leaders. And I will say after a couple years of madness, this is quite, this is quite a task to keep people pulling in the same uh, direction. So the, the rest of this sermon, the last point will be essentially how you could make my job easier if you were interested in making my job easier. How is unity maintained? How is it maintained in the church? And how is it attained? How is it attained? How do we go for it? Well, Paul's super clear in verse 2. With all humility and then gentleness. With patience. Bearing with one another in love. 
and being eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Humility and gentleness. We've been proud and harsh, haven't we? I want to remind you that pride is incredibly sneaky. So if you're sitting here and you're thinking, well, maybe you and others here have been proud and, and harsh, but, but not me. I don't think pride's my vice. I just want to remind you of a few sneaky ways that I've watched pride creep into our church. Not the church or the nation. Our church. The first is this. Remember that at times, pride is not thinking too highly of yourself, but thinking too much on yourself or making everything about you. An unhealthy preoccupation with self, not just thinking, oh, I'm the bomb. Some of you are here thinking, I never think I'm the bomb. That's fine. You can still deal with and be operating in pride. At times over the last year, and maybe this is only true for me, but I've personalized so much of this. And it's been so uh, helpful to step back and realize that this isn't about me and it doesn't revolve around me. At times over the last year, when I've been asked to put on a mask, I'm like, why are you, like literally lady at Panera, why are you doing this to me? Why have you done this to me? Making me walk back to my car and find something on the ground and then wrap my face in it. Why are you doing this to me? Or a little bit closer to home, people coming to me and saying, I'm leaving this church and me immediately saying, why have you done this to me? Why have you brought trouble on me? And if I could pause long enough and not make that conversation about me, I found myself thinking, what about their family? What about their faith? What about their walk with God? What about the place they're in? But most of the time, I couldn't move past why have you done this to me? So you may not have thought too highly of yourself in the last year, but it is possible that you thought too much about yourself or on yourself. Get your TP, right? The second way that I've watched pride creep in in my own life and in my own church is the statement that simply goes, I have no need of you. I have no need of of you. And maybe you've not said this. This is Paul's language. The Apostle Paul, when speaking to the church in Corinth, is trying to get a divided church to work together. So he employs the metaphor of the body, that each one of us plays a right, vital role, but it's very vital that we stay connected to one another. And then he paints this hilarious picture of the foot saying to everyone else, I have no need of you. And you can just picture it in your mind's eye. It's hilarious. You know, the foot marching off, however a foot would march off, screaming back at the body, I have no need of you! And then the body limping around, and I don't have any need of you either! Done with you! We're kidding ourselves. As I reflected on this, I, I thought how beautiful it would be if the church as a whole instead adopted the phrase, I, I, I need you. I need you. That's why this hurts so bad, is that I do, in fact, need you. And I've watched people hive off with other feet, all the feet together, yelling back at the body, I have no need of you. I've watched the body say, that's fine. 
You go try to be feet apart from the body. I, I don't need you either. It's an arrogant statement, and it's a, a really interesting way that pride creeps in. Listen, the Bible's really clear. You see in part, and you know in part. So the thing we should be 100% certain of is that you see things partially, and you know things. That's the one thing you should be certain of, is that you don't have it all. You were designed by God to need the input of others, and at no point will you arrive in a place where you do not need the rest of the body. So I believe that pride has worked its way in in a tribalism that would say, I have no need of others. The third way I've watched pride creep into my own life, because I'm very involved, is the statement, no one cares like I care. No one gets it. No one understands. No one but me sees. And there's a, a self-righteousness of the activist that's so dangerous. I've discovered over the years of hanging out with missionaries and people who lead nonprofits that some of the sweetest folks you, you meet, you meet on the mission field. Some of the nastiest folks you meet, you meet on the mission field. Why? Because there's, they're involved. They're activists. They're doing the stuff. And what is the church doing anyways? And there's a sort of self-righteousness that you can't see that's keeping people from joining you in your cause because it eliminates varying levels of participation. A better statement would be no one cares maybe in the way you care. But there certainly are different ways to care and different issues to care about. One of the creepy ways that pride creeps in is this sort of no one sees what I see and no one cares the way I care. So would you right now just humble yourself if you're sitting next to one? We're just going to do this little exercise. We don't do it often, so I'm going to make you do it here at church. If you're here alone and you're having to say this to a stranger, I'm sorry. But would you just with your mouth turn to someone and say, it is not about me. Humble yourself. It is not about me. Would you say to them, I need you. I have need of you. Even if I don't agree with you, I have need of you. Would you turn to someone and say, my seeing is suspect. I only see in part. Go ahead, acknowledge it out of your mouth. God designed me to be deeply needy. Say it. God designed me to be deeply needy. Say this with me. Other people care. There is more than one way to care, and there's more than one thing to care about. We've been proud. We've been harsh and not gentle. This uh, passage, I thought it was so cool. Just the, just the simple line that you would be eager to maintain unity. I thought, wow, who do I know who's eager to maintain unity? Who's leaning into it? How can I seize this opportunity to unify this group? Eager to maintain unity. What I've noticed in myself and in others is not an eagerness to unite, not an eagerness to find common ground, certainly not an eagerness to reconcile, or an eagerness to forgive or to bear with one another. What I've observed in my life and in the life of the church at times is that we've been eager 
to cast judgment. We've been eager to sentence. We've been eager. We've jumped to labels. We've jumped to assume. We've jumped to decide because if they liked that post, then that must mean the following. We've been eager to cancel. We've been eager to write people off. Now, the Bible clearly tells us to judge. I know someone's going to lob this back in your face like, hey, man, Jesus said not to judge. Well, that's not entirely true. Jesus said to judge. Judge a tree by its fruit. He said we should discern. The type of judgment that Jesus condemns is a sort of self-righteous judgment that doesn't keep in mind its own need for mercy. So we are to judge. We are to discern. We're not to do that from a self-righteous place. We've been eager to say it's this or it's that. When is it ever this or that? We've been so eager to draw lines and say it's this or it's that. When has it ever been in your life as simple as either this or that? It's usually somewhere between this and that, isn't it? Even when we're certain, even when we're clear, there's more to be added to the conversation. Humility and gentleness is how we maintain the bond of the spirit. Pride and a harshness is how we divide the church. Now again, in saying I need you, we're not saying I agree with you. There's a way to need even those who we don't agree with and to receive them. You guys know all this. Lastly, worship team, would you guys come? Paul talks about patience and uh, forbearance in some of your translations or enduring, uh, bearing with one another in love is maybe the way it's described in your translation. I just love how realistic this passage is and the Bible for that matter. He's not saying, come on people now. Let's be together. No, he's very clear that in order to maintain unity, you don't just have to be with one another. You have to, embear, you have to <laughs> bear with one another. And you know what this means? You know what this means to build Christian community and to maintain the bond of peace? It means patience. And that word in some of your Bibles is translated long-suffering. Long-suffering paired with the word forbearance is essentially really, really long, long suffering. Enduring long suffering is very realistic. This isn't going to happen without patience. This isn't going to happen without being able to bear with one another in love. That word for bearing one, for, with one another because here's the deal. We'll be with one another. That's cool. I'll be with you until I have to bear with you. And when I have to bear with you, I'm going to bail on you. That's it. That's how we've got it framed up in most of our relationships. Hopefully not those closest to us, like your kids. But it's like, we'll be until we have to bear. And Paul's saying, if you're going to bear, if you're going to have build Christian unity, you better get ready to bear with one another, which means to endure. Isn't that a wild thought that you have to be endured? No, no, not me. Yeah, you. Someone has to endure you. I just thought, oh my goodness. Well, certainly I have to endure others. And I thought, no, no, others have to endure me. And the more they get to know me, the more they have to endure. Wow. So he says, you, you got to be patient. You got to suffer long. And then you have to endure other people if you're going to maintain this type of unity. Our bailing on one another doesn't represent 
What bailing on one another represents is the name on the back of the jersey is more important than the name on the front. And if I could coach you up the way Paul would coach you up, I would say the name on the front of our jersey, way more important than the one on the back. And the problem with this, the problem with the lack of humility and the lack of gentleness and the lack of patience and the lack of bearing with one another is it doesn't represent, it doesn't represent him. The one who's slow to anger and then abounding in a steadfast love. He's been so patient with us. He's been so patient with me. I want to represent that to the people around me. He's endured so much. Talk about bearing with us. He bore us on the cross. He wasn't just putting up with your chatter because he was slightly annoyed with you. He was punished for your sins. He bore you in that jersey we wear represents a God who's slow to anger and abounding in a steadfast love. Would you stand with me? If unity is our goal, I believe that we have no hope. If we're going to make unity our aim, if we continue to move towards union with Christ, I believe that we'll find ourselves more united with one another. We may not be able to have unity, but we can have more humility. We can have more gentleness. We can have more patience. And we can bear with one another. We can do this. And if we do these things as a byproduct, I believe that we'll experience greater unity. Let's look to Jesus, lift up the name of Jesus, and ask him to unite us. Let's read together Philippians 2 on the screen. Just continue to magnify Jesus and his work. Ask that he would make us more like him. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility, Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, we look to you as your people in need this morning. We thank you, Jesus, that you didn't put us in our place. You could have. You didn't put us in our place. You raised us up with your life and your words. and I want to thank you, Jesus, for not holding on to your place, but emptying yourself, humbling yourself, reaching us. We look to you. We love you. We want to be like you, Jesus. Would you help us, Lord? Would you help us live lives worthy of the calling you've placed on us? We, we want to represent. We want to represent.
thank you for bearing with us. You could and should have been done with us, but you keep coming because you've been so patient with us. We love you. We look to you. And everyone said, amen. See you guys next week. Maybe it won't be 111. <laughs>